Well, so thank you all for, for joining the Zoom. I know this is um, different circumstances. We definitely uh, miss being in person, but we're making the best of this. Um, and I know at the beginning of the year, I'd sent out a call for topics that folks were interested in, um, both from the learning standpoint and hear about use cases across research and industry. And one of the topics we had heard about was uh, natural language processing, NLP, and hearing more about that. And so I'm really excited that uh, Lena uh, is joining us today from State Farm uh, to talk to us about um, just some of the things she's been learning and her experience uh, related to natural language processing, how it works in, in the real world, and, and what are some specific uh, examples at State Farm and, and, and so she'll be giving a, a great presentation today and if you guys have questions um, I think we'll try to make use like we did last month of the chat interface so I will be monitoring the chat um, the, the group chat and so feel free to post your question there and I can kind of moderate and intervene um, either during uh, Lena's presentation or near the end because um, we're making definitely making time um, for a Q&A so with that I will let uh, Lena take over Perfect. Thank you very much for the introduction, Matt. So my name is Lina Farouk. I'm a data scientist at State Farm. And today I'll be talking about natural language processing and how it delivers business value. We will start off with the agenda. Uh, so first I'll talk about not, like why we should use natural language processing and specifically in the uh, case of insurance. I will then quickly go over the challenge that we're facing that actually caused us to consider natural language processing, what it is, what the important steps in NLP are, the different NLP tooling solutions, some of them being vendor solutions, other being open source. We will then take a quick look at the NLP pipeline and go into more details for the important NLP steps. Uh, I will then cover a few NLP use cases in the insurance industry. We will then talk about NLP modeling with a specific example uh, for modeling with text-derived variables. I will then conclude with the future state of NLP. So why should we use natural language processing? A lot of you might have already seen this chart, which basically tells us that most of the data we have is unstructured data, basically 80% unstructured versus 20% structured. Uh, the unstructured can be in many forms, such as pictures, videos, text, audio. So in the case of insurance, we have unstructured data such as claim file notes, claim injury notes, uh, survey answers and comments, and the survey can of course be from external customers or internal from other employees, underwriting notes, customer product reviews, OCR, which is the optical character recognition. So basically extracting useful text from scanned documents. So let's say we have an invoice from an auto shop, we can extract the dollar values on them or extracting also useful information from police reports. Uh, of course, we have a lot of unstructured text in the form of emails, mails and fax. We have a lot of call center notes. Uh, we have chat and chatbot transcripts, service ticket description, voice to text. Again, we have a lot of audio. So basically all customer calls, these can be converted to text and then analyzed. So what is the challenge? Uh, the challenge is that the answer to our business problem is buried in millions of text record and it's really difficult to manually go through these to find and extract the information we need and therefore we considered NLP. So let's start with a definition of NLP. It basically uses statistical linguistic techniques and machine learning models to extract business value and insight from text data. So what we want to do is we want to take that unstructured data and turn it into structured data that our machine learning models can understand. Um, as a business, we all care about our customers. So having an indicator to identify the customers that we're considering switching insurers next month would help us a lot with customer satisfaction and retention. So let's take a look at the important steps in NLP. 
So as I said, our main goal is to develop text-derived variables. How can we do that? The first step is to detect patterns in the text. So basically, if I have like a survey answer and the customer is telling me they waited too long. So wait too long, that's a pattern. I can use that as a, a binary variable. I take these uh, vari the patterns and, as I said, turn them into structured variables. In this case, it can be a binary indicator. So for example, if they tell us they waited too long, we would have this binary indicator and then uh, score all the different observations I have. So some customers will have that in their survey answers and other not. So this way we can create many uh, categorical or numeric uh, variables using our unstructured data. We will then take these text-derived variable and combine them with our structured variables that we have that might be customer demographics or basically anything we have about the customer that is in a structured form. Uh, we can also use sentiment analysis. So basically how happy or unhappy was the customer? So doing that analysis on their survey answers will also allow us to maybe add another variable that can have a range, for example, from negative five to five, negative five being the most negative and five being the most positive. So that way I added an additional variable that will also improve the model performance. Uh, now let's take a quick look at the different tooling solutions we have. And as I mentioned earlier, we have some open source solutions and some vendor solutions. The open source solutions are mainly Python packages such as NLTK, Spacey, Scikit-Learn. We also have Google BERT. And there is actually a lot of development in the open source world. It's still, um, in my opinion, it's still not as strong as the vendor solutions because the vendors, the vendors are actually spending a lot of money on these solutions. Uh, and some of the vendor solutions we have are Megaputer, Polyanalyst, AWS, Comprehend, Salesforce, Einstein, MLP, NLP, and Medallia, NLP. Uh, and actually for this presentation, we will be seeing some screenshots from Megaputer Polyanalyst. So let's take a, a look at the NLP pipeline. So like, like most of the data science projects, we have to start with data pre-processing. So we need to access the data, manipulate it as needed, clean it, and also identify the language, of course, since we're going to deal with the text. Um, after that, we want to transform these, uh, the text we have into features. So basically, we will do text discovery, identify the important keywords and key phrases. T uh, text tagging is also very important. So basically, part of speech tagging to add that to the, uh, the words that I found. Entity resolution and linking. Did I find important entities in the text? And we will come to more details about these steps, but entity are basically names, phone numbers, emails, and then also uh, linking them together. So does this phone number, for example, belong to this person? Uh, sentiment analysis, as I mentioned earlier, is very important. Text clustering, like uh, seeing how the different documents are correlated to each other. What are the significant um, topics that appear within the documents and that kind of link them together. And then using all that analysis, we can start creating our structured variables and then scoring all the other, uh, all of our observations on the newly created structured variables. Uh, then we come to the modeling part, which again, if we have, we should also have some structured variables. Usually we do like, ori like original structured variables. So for example, customer demographics in the case of customer surveys, um, we add them together and do the modeling part. And then of course we report the results and we can use an API to actually implement this. So it will at the end be an integrated, easy to use, production ready, and it's very scalable as well. 
So taking a closer look at some of the important NLP steps from the pipeline we just covered. So data cleansing is of course very important. So when, when you use the cleaner your data, the better your analysis. So, but in this case, you also have to keep in mind that this is unstructured text and we're changing the data kind of when we correct it. So it's true, we want to get rid of some of the typos, but we don't wanna take it too far that we're kind of changing things about the text. And what is very important here is the Levenstein distance. So basically, how many edits do I want to allow for each of the words? Do I want to only, for example, take one letter out, add one letter, replace one letter? So the Levenstein distance is usually a very good threshold that can be used to kind of uh, set like how much you want to clean. And of course, it depends on how clean your data already was. Uh, the context sensitive, sensitive, sensitive abbreviation is also very important. So let's say your text includes comp. So do we know what comp is supposed to mean? Is it supposed to mean comprehensive, comparative, compensation? So again, in this case, it's very important to actually use a customized dictionary for the business problem in hand to get greater accuracy. So usually when you're developing a model, you should use a dictionary that suits the kind of data you have. So if it's, a, if it's medical data, for example, you want to make sure you use an appropriate dictionary. Uh, TFIDF, which stands for Term Frequency Inverse Document Frequency. Uh, this weight is a statistical measure uh, used to evaluate how important a word is to a document in a collection or a corpus, like a dictionary. Uh, so um, in this case, we want to make sure that we're actually using the dictionary root of the word. So let's say we have eat, ate, and eating. We want them all to appear as eat in my uh, matrix because we want to make sure that we were not causing a sparsity problem. Uh, now we'll look at the keyword and phrases. So if, if I take my data and I just do a frequency count on all of the words I have, I will see that the ones with the highest counts are actually things that aren't necessarily very important to this specific data set, such as the or a and like things that would appear in any English text as the highest frequency probably. So in this case, it's very important to actually remove these stop words as they're only causing noise and they're not really providing any useful information. So here, again, this is a screenshot from Polyanalyst Megaputer. We can see the different keywords that it found and it assigned to each a significance. And here, this is the support and frequency. The frequency is basically how many times this word appeared at all in all the documents. And the support is in how many documents it actually appeared. So contact appeared 1,402 times, but only in 574 different documents. And then the significance is actually very important. This is calculated on a scale from 0 to 99, and it represents how distinct a particular keyword is for all text in the column being explored. So for example, contact, you might notice here, doesn't really appear as much as car. So car here uh, appears more than 2,500 times, but contact has a higher significance. And the greater the significance, the greater the chance that the concepts in the investigated data revolve around such a word. That means that contact in the data set I have is actually very important. And it's not necessarily the one that appears the most or in the most documents. Uh, the correlation between the keywords, again, is very important. So after, this is, again, a screenshot from Polyanalyst, and this is what we call a link chart, and it basically checks if there is any correlation between the different keywords and phrases that I've extracted. So this example here, spark plug is correlated to cylinder head, and it's actually showing a darker line compared to traffic light 
and stop sign, meaning there is a there is a greater correlation between these two compared to these two. Uh, lemmatization and tokenization. So again, the lemma is the dictionary form of the word. And as I mentioned earlier, this helps reduce sparsity when we get rid of the different variations of the words. So these are basically the dictionary forms of the words we have. And we will come to the part of speech in a bit. And tokenization is actually the positional tagging. So again, it, the tokenization is basically uh, the process for breaking up the stream of text into words, not only words, actually words, uh, symbols, any numbers. So here we also have punctuation. And then in the tokenization, it will tell me like details about these words. So here we have it appeared in text number one in sentence one. It was the first word basically and the start symbol is zero and the length symbol is four. So it's basically, uh, it's a method to simplify the content prior to the next step of the processing. Um, and yeah, this will actually, this is actually very useful to also detect patterns. Because if I see, for example, that disk uh, always appears before break, then this might be an interesting pattern to look at or any other pattern. Uh, part of speech tagging and phrase finding. So part of speech tagging is again very useful as it helps us differentiate words when they appear, for example, as a verb versus a noun. So if I have tire as an example, tire as a noun means something completely different versus tire as a verb. So knowing what part of speech uh, we have is again very important. Uh, we can also attempt to find phrases, so not only keywords, because sometimes a phrase can be much more meaningful than looking at the individual keywords within that phrase, and that can also help with building the variables. Uh, the syntactic parsing, this basically finds the relationships between the words. So in a sentence, what is my subject? What is my object? How are these words related? Let's say you're analyzing and you're looking for the word pulled. You don't want like any random pull. Maybe you want specifically pull when the subject of it is chords, for example. And like looking at these different relationships and taking them into account instead of uh, just looking for this keyword, for example, and this keyword separately, you might be more interested in their relationship together. Like for example, if I have car and damage, I don't care about any type of damage and I don't care about any car just when it appears in the text. I want the relationship between them. Uh, now we'll talk about entity extraction. Again, entities are things such as names, organizations, places, amounts. So basically, uh, things you might be interested in in the text. Let's say uh, you want to know like who like who caused a problem. You're looking for a name in the text, and then you also want the name that person's contact information. So you can also extract other entities such as address and phone number. But again, there might be several addresses or several phone numbers in your text. So you want to kind of link your entities together. You want to know that this uh, phone number specifically belongs to this person. And again, this will help automate a lot of things. Like you can get text, you don't have to manually go through it and find the person's name. Let's say like uh, you receive a letter and you wanna know like who this letter is about and you also want to add their contact information. So this will can automate a lot of the work. Uh, again, sentiment analysis, very important. Uh, and it kind of like, let's say you get like a lot of customer complaints. You want to know what these complaints are about. So uh, this again is from Polyanalyst. Uh, and here it kind of shows me the different head objects that it's talking about. So vehicle, and it's telling me like what sentiment was associated with vehicle. So here we can see that 
negative sentiment was actually associated with it 176 times and only 22 times it was positive. And here, tire, for example. And then it would also show you in the text itself, so these tires are dangerous. This was the negative, one of the negative sentiments that it found. Uh, and what if you don't really want to look at specific words, you get like a bunch of complaints and you just want to see all the negative sentiment that was in the text. So polyanalyst has that capability as well. And here you can kind of look at the different sen negative sentiment analysis that was uh, associated. So here, sensors, malfunctions, problem existing, and a lot of other examples. Um, for the, for, again, use lemmas or keywords, and now we actually want to use them for clustering. So as I mentioned earlier, clustering can again help me identify like things that are related to each other, uh, and this will can be very useful when I'm creating the structured variables. So here, for example, car problem, this is one of the clusters, transmission, replace, leak, Honda, so all these different clusters kind of give me an idea what are the things that appear together a lot. And here you can kind of uh, go through the different um, instances. We can also use the lemmas or keywords for classification. So again, for modeling, for example. Uh, and in this case, we would create the like the lemmas or keywords would be in that case my binary variables and I would just have a yes no for each of the observations and then I can also go through the confusion matrix and see like if this is what I was looking for or not so we might have some false positives some false negatives to work on and these might actually be due to like for example this one was for death so death is the variable here and death might appear like let's say I'm looking for any death that occurred like death itself might appear in the text but not necessarily mean that there was a death so going through these false positives and reviewing them and then modifying uh, the code to kind of exclude these is very useful so now we will go over a few use cases in insurance. So document review is very, uh, can be uh, helped a lot using NLP. So let's say claims get a call, for example, and they have to review a lot of documents to know what the claim is about because they haven't necessarily ever seen that claim. So using NLP, we can maybe extract the inf important information for, from all of these documents so they don't have to manually go and review each of them. So this will, of course, improve the speed of the review and the customer experience. Uh, study claim files, so we can actually use NLP to help us pick the right structured variables to use in our model. I know now we're dealing with the unstructured, like we want to create from the unstructured ones, the structured ones, but this can also give me an idea, what are the best structured variables I could use in my model? So let's say, for example, using my analysis, I find that T-bone at intersection appears a lot and seems to be very important. So I can maybe start asking the customer specific questions in advance to build good structured variables. Like when they are opening a claim, for example, I can have a set of questions that I actually prepared based on the analysis of my unstructured data. And this would again help with the modeling. Uh, we can of course analyze the customer experience. Uh, since I, uh, I showed you earlier, we can analyze like the chat bot transcripts, we can analyze the calls, we can analyze the emails, mails and fax. So using that, we can also conclude like what are the customers not very happy with? Do they not like our surveys? Are the surveys too long? Uh, are we too slow at responding to email? Uh, did, are they telling us they sent us a mail that never 
that we never received. So these different analyzing the text will help us also assess how well each communication channel is working. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we can also use NLP to improve the claims processing cadence. So as I said earlier, we can make the, like instead of the claims person going through all the different documents, we can improve that. But we can also, like once they open the claim, we can maybe give them a summary about the claim, maybe um, ha tell them like what, like a short summary, what the claim is about, why the cost, like, make them more familiar with the claim without actually having to go through it. And that way, the customer will feel that the claims person is aware of the claim and actually knows how to help them. Uh, incoming call note analysis. So we can use NLP to identify who's calling us and what do they want. We can, th this can also help us find the weaknesses in the claim process. Uh, because we can maybe look for what people are calling us the most about and maybe try to tweak the process to reduce the number of calls. And maybe they're calling about the same thing several times. So there might also be like a process, a weakness in the process that we could fix uh, using that analysis to make our customer experience better. Uh, chatbots. So we can also make use of chatbots to, at the start, we can use them to answer, answer the easier questions and leave the more complicated ones to be routed to human because this would simply take some load off the staff and so they can focus on the more complicated things. Uh, we can then also analyze the chatbot transcripts and add whatever the frequently asked ones to our website uh, frequently asked questions, for example. And again, this will reduce the number of chats we get, whether to the bot or also to the human. Now we'll take a look at the NLP modeling. So there are two general types. There is the text only one, which is which can be based on so many uh, these things. Um, so it can it can be the intent. It can also be the topic modeling. So in this case, we can find topics. What are customer complaints about, for example? Uh, sentiment analysis, who are the customers that aren't satisfied? Why aren't they satisfied? So sentiment analysis will actually help us identify these customers. Uh, classification, again, uh, we can uh, classify incoming texts. So uh, let's say, for example, we're getting um, a lot of surveys, we can classify them into, for example, complaints or only feedback that doesn't really need to be worked out. And that will help us get to the complaints faster. We can also do a supplemental attributes and basically adding the text derived variables uh, with traditional variables. Like, like again, for the we can add them to the structured ones we have about our customer. Uh, and an example here is uh, the, the policy lapse or cancellation. So for this, we will not only use our structured variables, but we will also add to the structured variables, the newly created ones that were cre created based on unstructured data, which in this case, for example, can be the text from the customers, the customer calls, their survey answers, any emails coming in from them. And this will definitely give us a better better picture of the customer overall. Um, I know I have spent a lot of time talking about how to create text-derived variables, and there are definitely other more sophisticated techniques that could be used, but the business partners you work with should be ready for the level of sophistication before you utilize them. Uh, so, and again, a lot of these, you can create the, um, the different structured variables and then use them in a lot of very advanced modeling techniques. 
So here uh, we will actually look at an example for modeling with text-derived variables. And here we're looking at example when we're examining a the police police reports in general. And we want to know a few things like. Uh, we want to find out what happened before the accident. So, for example, did someone fail to yield? Did someone run a red light? Was someone speeding? And then we can take these, and as I said, here we're kind of finding the patterns in the text, so fail to yield, and these are the different claim IDs I have, and then I would have a binary indicator for each. Uh, and then uh, I could also um, add the these uh, structured, the unstructured ones I created to the structured ones I have that can include anything we know about the customer that would be useful for modeling. And the text derived variables will increase model performance. Uh, as we said before, structured data is only 20%. So we need to make use of the unstructured data we have to achieve better model performance as most of the data is unstructured. So what is the future state of NLP? So in the next two to five years, uh, we're hoping to see more usage of NLP more users analyzing larger data sets. So as insurance, we get a lot of claims per day. So we have a lot of data that we don't just want to sit there. Uh, a lot of file notes that we can make use of in our modeling. Uh, we can also use, uh, make use of deep learning models that are more sophisticated. So basically we can prepare the uh, text derived variables really well and then use these in more complicated modeling techniques to improve the accuracies. And of course, for the more advanced um, black box modeling techniques, they usually require high performance computing. And of course, we all want to move to near real time NLP. So I, as I said, human chat assistance, phone call assistance, like making things very easy for the claims person and also giving the customer the satisfaction by them feeling that we know exactly what they're talking about, what the claim is about, although it might have been our first time to see the, to see the claim or to talk to the customer. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Hi. Hi. Hi, uh, my name's Nolan, and thanks for the talk. I have a, a question about the, the last slide about future direction, and you mentioned the use of uh, deep learning models. Yep. I am wondering that actually if you guys have uh, uh, implemented or deploy any of these type models on your uh, like in like real time use at your company, things like BERT or uh, Elmo or things like that, like very recent uh, deep models that have uh, have a state of the art performance. Yeah, so actually the like BERT and the really newly ones that came out are still under research for State Farm and we are keeping an eye on whatever is coming out and researching it and weighing like how how effective they would be compared to what we are using at the moment. I see. Okay, thank you. Alina, I got a question from the chat. Uh, so the question is, what are some of the examples of tools you use to automate your data engineering before doing the actual NLP? Uh, are they open source or vendors and which ones? So I think it's for that, that slide where you gave through all the steps of an NLP pipeline. What, what are yeah. tools you use for that? Sure, I don't know how easy it will be to, oh, right there. Okay, so for State Farm, we're actually keeping an eye on both. So we're, we are using open source solutions. So, so like the Python packages I have here, like NLTK, Spacey, Scikit-Learn, but we're also taking a very close look at the vendor solutions. So as I showed you here, Megaputer Polyanalyst, we're using like 
the, like the screenshots here, you can see you can use that for the um, text feature engineering. We are also all we always have an open eye on all the vendor solutions and actually evaluate them and weigh the pro, uh, pros and cons to see what is the best one for the project in hand. So I wouldn't say we stick to vendor versus open source. It's usually based on the project. So it's the right tooling for the business question at hand. And then a follow-up question. Uh, so when you deploy your NLP models, uh, mm -hmm. which platforms do you use? Do you use a cloud platform? Like AWS, um, Google Cloud, or Azure, or do you do? Is it integrated in internal systems? It's actually internal. So at the moment, we are not like we've we've um, researched AWS, but at the moment, we did not deploy our production models there. Uh, so at the moment, it is internal. Okay. Um, another question. Uh, someone's wondering if you have experimented with uh, generative adversarial networks for NLP related tasks. Um, I have not. I don't know if Jeff Ramble, do you want to add a comment to that or not sure if he's on the line. I'm not sure if that was used in State Farm. I thought Jeff might be able to confirm that. Yeah, I think that's an emerging method. So um, it might be that it hasn't gotten, it, okay. it's not widely adopted at this point. So mm -hmm. um, other questions, yeah, you can put in the chat or you could unmute yourself if you wanna ask it directly. Other questions for Alina. Um, I guess one question I had, uh, you, you talked about both the NLP pipeline and the even um, the models. So it sounds like when you're evaluating a model at the end state, that's fairly easy to do. You have certain classification tasks. Mm -hmm. um, is there ways to measure the quality of your NLP pipeline, like kind of the data cleansing and future engineering? Are there any metrics you use to uh, assess the quality as it's flowing through? Um, that part of it before you do modeling? So what we tend to do is actually involve our business partners in these steps. So we create the, the text derived variables and of course we get a lot of business partner input because that usually is very helpful as a start. And we, once we start creating these and we kind of test the perform, like the modeling part, we a lot of times start with rule-based models. So basically we create like the patterns and the sentiment and then see if they occur in our, uh, in our entries or not. So just a basic rule base. So you have the binary indicators without actually using any like advanced modeling techniques and then we would involve our business partners for feedback like they would look at the results like we would just run a random sample through and see like a test sample and see what the results are and then they would provide review so we usually we have that feedback loop during development before we actually uh, put a model in production so Lena, this is Jeff. I'll, I'll add on to that too, that a lot of the work that we're doing with text mining is going into a, a regulatory space. And so there is some need to understand what's going on at all times and then to kind of lock down that process. And so as Lena pointed out, there there's a lot of communication with the business partner and we, we might automatically find some patterns, but then they're going to get refined again by our business partners so that um, our, our pro underlying processes can be explained or if, if necessary from a, a legal standpoint. Okay, thanks. Uh, another question from the chat. In the future, maybe a few years down the road, how much of the NLP model building process that you described will be automated? And which parts of the process will you need to devote the most time to? What will be new parts introduced in the process if it gets more sophisticated over time? So if you continue your crystal ball and look in, <laughs> as you mentioned, what's going to happen, <laughs> like that question is about how much of the NLP process will be automated, what will be manual? 
I actually think a lot of it will be automated. I wouldn't say all of it. I still believe there's, there will always be a manual part in it. So I think a lot of like the data cleansing is already being automated. Um, like even like fitting like different models, trying different techniques, a lot of these will be automated, but I still think like the part, like having something customized for each of the data sets, I think this will always require some manual tweaking. I don't think there is like one thing that would, or even several things that could always work for the business problem in hand. So I believe a lot of the steps will be automated, like the cleaning, the things that are kind of the same for all, but then again, a lot of the things are very data set specific. So I believe these part will still be manually done. Okay. Um, any last questions? I think I got through all the ones in the chat. Okay, well, uh, Lena, it's, it has been requested for you to share your slides. So if you wanna send me your slides, I can put them on the meetup group. Um, and we'll also try to get the recording of this out as well, because I know some people um, were not uh, able to make it today. So thank you all for joining. Thank you, especially to Lena, just for uh, putting the time in to prepare this material and to present to us. This is very insightful, uh, both for the current state and the future. Um, so I appreciate it. So thank you, everybody, and hope everyone's doing well. And uh, we'll be in touch about future meetup sessions. Perfect.